it is my distinct pleasure to uh, uh, bring Max uh, Techmark, a dear friend and uh, somebody that, that I look up to tremendously, who's been uh, extremely active for you know, many years now in, in helping us avert um, global catastrophic risks, uh, existential risks, and many more. Um, things like uh, climate change and nuclear war and um, AGI risk and, uh, and so much more. And um, uh, Max, actually the impetus for this event uh, and many more that we'll have in the future, um, Max and I were talking uh, somewhat recently about uh, how Orwellian systems are potentially possible in the near um, future in, in a degree that have never been possible before uh, using technologies that are available now and that we really need to uh, work on this uh, now uh, as fast as we can. Uh, and so this is a, a call to you builders and, and all of us to uh, work on the technology. Um, I'll hand it over uh, to Max uh, uh, in a moment uh, to uh, kick off, off the discussion and then I'll return um, to have a fireside chat. Uh, Max, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. The Orwellian systems, this is a topic very, very dear to my heart and uh, I'm so delighted to get to uh, discuss with this with you all. I'll uh, start by just to stir things up a bit, share some slides with you and some thoughts as provocative as I can and then look forward to the fireside chat and, and subsequent discussion. It's... Um, <clears throat> Fascinating, I think, as a, as a little homo, the little homo sapiens that I am, to think about how technology is really empowering us. After 13.8 billion years, most of which didn't see much in life at all here, and then a long period when we humans were just running around trying to not starve to death, uh, we have started to become more and more the captains of our own destiny. Right? We're developing the science and technology, letting us understand the world and, and shape the world the way we want it which is giving us these amazing opportunities, which we can either use to make life flourish like never before, not just for the next election cycle, but for billions of years, and not just on Earth, but throughout much of our universe also, if, if we get it right. Or we can use the same technology to drive us our, ourselves extinct through some really stupid use of technology. You know, this month is probably the greatest risk of creating an accidental nuclear war or not accidental since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That would not be a humanity's finest moment, for instance. So so we're getting more empowered. How can we make sure that we as a species make the smart decisions and not the dumb decisions? Well, part of it has to be to have a really healthy discussion so we can consider our options and make the wisest choice. If we end up with the Ukraine crisis escalating into a global nuclear war between the US and Russia, for example, and the, as, a, as a, in a recent Nature Food paper that came out the other month, you know, 99% of all Americans die of starvation, uh, and most 99% of the Russians and the Europeans, then you gotta ask yourself, how did that happen? And it's pretty obvious that nobody really wanted it. So the reason it happened was because we failed to have a functional conversation. We failed to use our collective intelligence as a species to make the wise choices. I think of it a little bit as if I'm walking on some beautiful cl cliff walk, I'm walking along the edge of the cliff. There's a little path there. And um, in fact, I went on a beautiful hike yesterday. And if I go too far to the left, I'm gonna just fall off and die. It's fine if, as long as I can see see where I'm going and make the right decisions. But suppose my brain were sliced up into little pieces somehow, or suppose there was a little censorship mechanism in my brain that whenever I was trying to decide whether I should turn a little bit to the left or to the right, all the thoughts about turning to the right were censored, prevented from happening, and I could only ever have impulses to go to the left. That would bias my decisions, and I would be more likely to go off the cliff. It's not a healthy situation for Homo sapiens to have it's to be in a very Orwellian state where we cannot have good re-conversation about important topics. So what's that got to do with Orwellian systems? Everything, of course, because if you have a very Orwellian system where this sort of free and healthy debate is impossible, it makes it much more likely that we as a species are just going to make 
really dumb decisions and we're going to squander this amazing potential that we have. That's why I care so much about these issues. Don't care. Yeah. So I put together some slides to stir things up a little bit. So, um, can you, um, see a slide? Uh, Just no, shout yeah. out. Now we can. Yes. Great. Can you see a different slide? Correct. Yes. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how artificial intelligence in particular is enabling uh, Orwellian systems and how it's enabling 1984, and um, not just in the future, but right now. And then, since we have the pleasure of having so many people here who love to build stuff, I want to talk about how can we use these same technologies to fight back against 1984, to expose it and make it easier for everyone to circumvent it so we can have these sort of useful helpful discussions across our planet about making the right choices. So if you live in China, and then then you're probably very aware of how Orwellian the system already is. Most when I visit China and I talk to just tech people, intellectual people, university people, they all know how censored they are. It's not hard to notice. You, go on your browser and you search for human right watch you don't even search you just actually go to hrw.org and you get a screen that looks like this so it's, it's kind of pretty in your face uh in in the west i find most people i know are less aware of how censored we already are that's probably because most of the people i know work at universities and uh it's kind of have the same opinions that are we're currently that the tech companies feel are acceptable. Um, but if you talk to people who don't hold those opinions in, America, in the West, they're often much more aware already of how, how Orwellian it's gotten. Um, if you want to do a quick experiment on, on your own, just take out your phone right now and go to one of the biggest Iranian news sites, uh, PressTV.com, and you'll see that the U.S. somehow, with their leverage over the internet, just sees the domain of it. So you'll get this. I tried this a few minutes ago. It should work for you. Um, but more generally, I think in, in the West, uh, censorship is much higher quality in the sense that it's harder to notice that it's there. I love this Baudelaire quote that the devil's finest trick is to persuade you that he doesn't exist. So if you're going to do really good Aurelian systems, one of the definitions of good is that most people in your population aren't even aware of how Orwellian it is. Um, <clears throat> but if you look a little more closely, it's pretty obvious that most ways that we communicate with each other today are very Orwellian, even in the West, not just in China. Both the, the legacy media, mainstream newspapers, social media, search, and also email. So let's talk just a little bit about where we are in terms of the Orwellian systems in the West. Um, legacy media, I'll come back and talk quite a bit about how, how, how much is just omitted and you don't how many important things you just don't hear about because someone doesn't want you to hear about it. Social media, well, just to make this a little more fun and, and personal, I'm just opening up my web browser and I did not particularly... Uh, prepare this for this talk. This just happens to be the tab that was open because we have this um, anti-radicalization project where we take a controversial story and we make a little video and show both sides to it to see if people can... for this Improve the News project. <laughs> that tweet is nowhere to be seen. It doesn't show up on my news feed. And in fact, it, we tested, it doesn't show up on anybody's news feed. Some AI algorithm decided that that video should not be shown to anybody except me, um, if I happen to know the tweet, because somehow they know best. Uh, as another example, 
let's try search. So let's just go to Google and pick some some topics. It might be a little controversial. So right now, you know, I'm pretty concerned about us getting into a nuclear war, as I just mentioned. So let's search for nuclear war. And um, let's click on news because I want to I want to see what what's going on here. Ah, a lot of stuff. C can you see it says that there are 31.6 million articles, news articles here in Google about nuclear war? Are you able to see my screen with this? Yes. Yes. No. Yep. Good. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so let's look at let's look at some of these. That sounds that's kind of cool, right? There's 30 over 31 million articles I have access to via Google. I can find them. So let's look. Scroll down here. Some stuff. Oh, they have 10 pages. Great. Let's go to page 10. Oh, there's more. Let's go to page 19. Great. Uh, 22. Oh, there are no more. Wait, wasn't there 31.6 million articles out there? Oh, but Google doesn't let me find them, actually. Uh, uh, somehow, it seems like these are the only ones that Google has decided I'm supposed to see. I don't know exactly what's going on here. My guess is that they are only showing me the ones that someone at Google had time to actually vet and make. For those listening in the stream, uh, Max will likely be back in a moment. The connection is going in and out. Here I'll go. The joys of live streaming. Um, Max is connecting from New Zealand, and so it's a, a long connection, and sometimes the internet hiccups, or there might be some censorship in the works. Does anyone have a tinfoil hat? <laughs> yeah. I'll give a couple seconds for Max to return, and if not, uh, I'll just start taking some questions from the audience for a moment. Great. Let's uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Yep, over here. Excellent. It, it was really, really nice to hear. And um, and actually, this group of, of talks has been called breakthroughs in computing, but I kind of just see them as nightmare fuel, if I'm honest. Um, but one of, one of the things which is, when tools are being built, one imagines that they're being created for the greater good. And we look at moments in history where tools have been given to kind of like the underdog, who later arise to be the oppressors. You know, Ahmed spoke about the example of Al Qaeda, and you know that was the setup there. Um, or where such tools, you know, which were built for good, find themselves in, in kind of not so good hands. Do you feel those who are creating such privacy and anonymity tools? are doing enough to ensure that those tools are not being used by the wrong people or in the wrong ways or for the wrong reasons. You know, one even wonders how that's at all feasible um, without implementing a level of moderation, which in essence is, is an antonym to privacy. Um, so, you know, is, is enough being done by, by these tool creators to kind of ensure that the tools are being used well um, and for good cause? I mean, I think this varies um, an enormous amount across different tools. There are certainly many tools that, are, that don't um, take this kind of thing into, into account uh, at all. Um, there's a lot of work in the more privacy-oriented technologies to really establish some uh, security guarantees and some privacy guarantees. Um, and, and kind of the, the um, one of the main goals is to get to a point where um, you can't look at traffic uh, moving moving around, 
um, and you can, oh, there we are, Max is back. So uh, Max, I'm answering a question quickly, uh, and then I'll uh, hand it back to you. Um, and so some, some ranges of tools are uh, uh, much more focused, are able to kind of give you anonymity and privacy and so on, and not kind of spy on you and, and collect your data and so on. But, but there are few and far between, and so most of the uh, products and so on that you use on a day-to-day -day basis maintain like these vast treasure troves of data about you that are then kind of used primarily to advertise but are kept decryptable by the by those companies to then be able to use in a bunch of ways and that means that there all of that is accessible to the state right so and this means many states because now the data is getting um, stored in in local regions right so it's not not just one state now um, users are their data is being kind of fragmented and put in a bunch of places and that means that many states have that, that access okay great I'll hand it up um, back to Max and uh, by the way huge thank you to Max for joining from New Zealand it's both uh, extremely early there um, and uh, and uh, connectivity uh, is getting in the way uh, Max we were joking that uh, maybe uh, uh, this is just a little bit of censorship getting in, in the way but we won't let them stop us so I'll hand it back to you Oh no! <laughs> there we go. I think I think you're there. Good, <laughs> great. The, the bandwidth here in my my Wellington hotel room isn't so great. So anyway, I was just giving you some little random samplers just from my own life of, as to how how or the Orwellian things that that I that I, I come across. Another thing that's been driving me absolutely nuts is this this the radicalization project that we're doing. Uh, um, when we try to promote things, we get blocked all the time by F Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Uh, we tried to promote the, um, our celebration of the of the guy who prevented nuclear war. Uh, this day in history, today is the 27th of October. Uh, this guy, Vasily Arkhipov, prevented a Soviet nuclear strike against the U.S. We thought that was pretty cool. They blocked this ad because they said that's political. We tried to celebrate a while back uh, the people who eradicated smallpox and saved hundreds of, of millions of lives. They blocked that because the ad had the word vaccine in it. Um, so it's these things are sort of borderline. It's hard to know whether you should laugh or cry about it. But you, you, you see it not just in, uh, in social media and in search. You even see, we even have problems now in email really stifling us. I used to think if, if I wanted email Juan, he would just get the e-message. But that's no longer true. Uh, we have we got um, about seventy thousand people signing up for uh, this newsletter with more unbiased news, and it turns out that uh, we can only actually reach about fifteen percent of them now, because for everybody else, Gmail put, puts it into the spam filter, even if they say they want it. And uh, there was the Stanford study that looked into these sort of things recently and found that. Um, they're using machine learning to pick out what goes into spam. And there, there are definitely some political aspects to it because, for example, uh, political emails from Republicans were six times more likely to get sent into the Gmail spam filter than those from the Democrats. So it, all ways in which we try to exchange information with each other are being a little bit more challenged now. So how can we help with this? It's, it's a bit trickier to work on this particular problem than most other tech problems. Like, if I want to work on crypto better cryptography, it's so obvious at least what the goal is, what I should try to do, right? Here, even figuring out what, what my goal should be is a bit tricky, but precisely because it, the truth itself is sort of obscured, sort of the nature of the beast, gets a bit more meta. So let's just talk a little bit about, before we talk about specific tools, just a framework for how to think about what the problem even is. If you look at media bias, which is an aspect of Orwellian systems, there's a lot of talk about fake news. I like to, but that's not the only thing you should think about. If, the, if you think about this Venn diagram, right, some stuff is true and, so, and some isn't. And then there's some stuff which is mentioned or claimed in the news and some which is just omitted. The, what we want is a lot of the green stuff in the middle, which is correct and true. Uh, there's a lot of talk about stuff on the right side here, which is claimed but false. That's the fake news, the disinformation. But in our experience, the part that's most dominant, actually, is the part in yellow on the left, the stuff you never even hear about, even though it is true. For example, if you take, you know, 
how many, many articles you read recently about the, the enormous tragedy happening in Yemen right now, where there's a child starving to death every 10 minutes or so. Uh, there are all these different topics that just, for some reason, we don't get to hear very much about. And and that's usually why these, these bad things persist. It, sunshine is the best disinfectant. If you let people find out about something bad, they usually stop it. Uh, it's Orwellian systems. So I would be remiss not to throw in a picture of George here. And um, it's really interesting to think about also, what is it again, that's the problem, you know, that we're trying to combat. And uh, so one axis is, you know, where do you draw the line between what's anti disinformation and then what's censorship? It's a trade-off between real information and freedom of speech, of course. Where where should you be in that trade-off? And another really interesting trade-off is, is between anti-disinformation and, and propaganda, because, you know, as George Orwell himself wrote, you know, basically the first thing any government will, or organization will do if they actually want to do propaganda will be to try to mask it as merely fighting disinformation. Fossil fuel lobby used to say, oh, you know, there's a climate hoax. And the climate change people are just spreading disinformation. It's the old, old, oldest trick in the book. Cambridge Analytica even admitted doing this pretty openly. And uh, I'm a scientist. So from my perspective, one of the key things we, we've learned in science is, is uh, how important it is to have a free and open discourse. It's not, not censored. And if, if, if Galileo put out a tweet saying, hey, guys, you know, I think the Earth actually revolves around the sun rather than the other way around, if, 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 uh, if Twitter had existed back then, you would probably have gotten flagged. This violates the community guidelines, you know, for, on disinformation. You should get the correct facts from Pope, or Pope Urban the Eighth. So I think what we've what we learn what we learned from this as scientists is we should never ever give powerful entities like governments, big companies, etc., special influence over fact checking, because figuring out the truth is just really hard. Uh, this article here argues that you know, the real pioneer in the U.S. Of, of fake news was arguably the tobacco industry. And uh, another tricky thing we have to be very mindful of when even asking ourselves what the problem is, is to distinguish symptoms from from actual root causes. So I suppose someone show this woman shows up at the doctor and says, you know, I have fever, cough and headache, you know, doctor says, okay, I'm going to treat you with ibuprofen. Do you think this is a fantastic doctor that fills you with confidence? Well, like, what would you say, Juan? I would expect a lot more questions. I would expect a lot more questions. Yeah, you would like some kind of diagnosis first, but rather than just treating the symptoms, but now, yeah, maybe maybe she has COVID nineteen. Maybe she would benefit from getting some steroids or something. Uh, but now look at our democracy. I think there's a pretty broad agreement that our democracy is just like also not doing so great at the moment, feeling a little bit unwell. What are, we have a lot of symptoms: the profusion of disinformation, we have filter bubbles, growing polarization. People hate each other more and more, both within countries and between countries. We have growing income inequality, a lot of anger at the establishment. So what do we do about this? A lot of people are like, okay, yeah, great. Let's just block the disinformation with machine learning and ban the hate speech. This is exactly like that lousy doctor who's just going in and treating the symptoms. Well, asking what the diagnosis even is. And I would argue in this case that uh, we're being hacked by AI very much in, in an Orwellian system. That's the a key part of what's actually causing these problems. And, and it's only once we see that that we can figure out better how to, to treat it. Let's look at this word disinformation again that's so often used to silence critics. If you, I looked it up in the dictionary for you and it says that it's false information and <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. Now, how do we know what's false? The first less, the number one most important thing I feel I've learned in my entire career as a scientist is that figuring out the truth is really hard. I really have to be humble. Sometimes it's really easy to figure out that something is false. 
sometimes it's not easy. You know, Facebook had to do a pool later on and say, oh, sorry, we kept banning these posts. Um, maybe we shouldn't have. Jack Dorsey himself said, oh, sorry, we blocked this New York Post tweet about their own article. That was a total mistake. Uh, it's not easy to know immediately what's true and what's false. And and um, even if it has nothing to do with politics, you know, we physicists spent 300 years believing in the wrong theory of gravity after Newton until it turned out that Einstein found the errors. And we, um, so humility has to be at the root of this. And this this leads to, from the first part of my talk, I've mainly been spending 10 minutes here talking about the problems. I want to spend just a little bit of the rest on, on strategies for making things better, tools we can build, etc. They don't want us to know. <laughs> Swept away by the Orwellian system and build a thing that... In particular, that... The best method we have so far as a species to figuring out the truth is science. And um, some of the key things we learn from there is humility again. Figuring out the truth is hard. So never, never let authorities tell you what's true or some committee that the government ha has or some company has. One of the key things we do in science is we do not... Um, we do not uh, listen to people more just because they are rich or have a fancy hat or because they're a minister. We judge them by their track record of making pre correct predictions in the past. That trust has to be earned in, in science. And anyone can say anything they want at a science conference. We don't believe in, at all in, in, in the sort of censorship. And, and those of you who are parents also know that if you're being too strict, it can often backfire and have exactly the opposite effect you want. And I, I think, um, I, I personally feel it, it's incredibly patronizing now when, when I go back, for example, when I went to Sweden, visit my mom, and I, just for fun, wanted to see what sort of spin and propaganda the Russian media were presenting to their own people. So I went to RT.com and the Swedish government had decided, no, no, Max, you're not allowed to see that because your feeble brain is so feeble that you're just going to believe everything Putin says and everything RT.com says. So they just blocked RT.com, biggest Russian news site in the entire European Union, you know, so pathetic. And this is just like, that's the same mistake that this, this woman is making with her daughter here. <clears throat> And another thing, yeah, so there are a lot of cool tools you can do where you try to take all the things that science does right and just bring them into the media ecosystem and, and um, make them accessible and less nerdy and boring for everybody. We did, um, uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about stuff that we've done and then you can brainstorm about things we can all do. A bunch of MIT students and I, for example, did, a, did some, pro started building some free tools. Um, we built a, a little free news aggregator, which I'll, I'll just show you a couple of minutes on. Uh... Improvethenews.org is a free news aggregator that lets you make up your own mind by reading a range of perspectives. I'm Max Tegmark, an MIT professor working on machine learning and physics. I had the idea for Improvethenews.org because I agree with Einstein's quote that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I feel that we should apply this to our news. Instead, media sometimes oversimplify and report things like a fairy tale, where one side is 100% good and the other side is 100% bad. Then machine learning comes along and gets us impulse clicking on these oversimplified stories, trapping us in hyper-partisan and hyper-nationalistic filter bubbles, creating an increasingly polarized world at a time when we instead need nuanced understanding that enables working together on great challenges. And we can see this polarization for many of the hundreds of topics tracked by ImprovedNews.org. For example, let's scroll down to social issues, click on its header to see its subtopics, and scroll to immigration. 
Although there's much talk about fake news, an even bigger problem is oversimplifying by omitting key facts. And the best way to catch those omissions is to read both sides, which improved news makes very easy by simply sliding a slider. So that's one tool we've had fun doing. We also use machine learning to, to read about 5,000 articles per day and figure out from 100 newspapers, figure out which ones are about the same thing. And then we separate out the facts that the, the articles across the controversy agree on from the narratives where they disagree. So you can easily rise above the controversy. We, we, we've also, I've also been, we're doing some academic stuff where we just use machine learning to see if we can measure the bias and find it more easily. And uh, that's been a ton of fun. For example, we published a paper, Samantha Delonzo and I, where we just took a million articles from a hundred newspapers and asked if with no human punditry at all, if the machine learning could just automatically find bias. And it could spectacularly. So for example, we just took all the articles about Black Lives Matter and uh, it automatically put all the newspapers on a spectrum which when you look at it, it looks like it's separated left from right. Although we didn't tell it anything about which newspapers were left or right. This is machine learning didn't even know what that meant. How did it do it? It just noticed that the frequency of words was very different. Some newspapers talked a lot about demonstrators where others talked about rioters. And, and when we looked at abortion articles, some talked a lot about fetuses and others talked about unborn babies instead. And then it found that these biases that it discovered were very correlated across topics and it automatically produced dictionary of, of, of emotionally loaded synonyms for things. So you, you can see, for example, that where some, if it's about immigration, some newspapers would talk a lot about asylum seekers, whereas others would talk about illegal immigrants or illegal aliens. Some would talk about assault style weapons while others talked about semi-automatic firearms. All of this just popped out of, from the data itself we didn't put any of this in. So machine learning is really powerful for discovering uh, when people are trying to hack you and manipulate you by word use. We also found that there was a whole other axis of bias, which we, we interpreted as pro-establishment versus establishment critical bias. So, you know, some, some newspapers like the New York Times, they will always talk about the defense industry Others will instead talk about the military industrial complex, which is not a word you'll find in New York Times or Fox News very much. As some it's not just whether you're critical or of the government, but also powerful companies. So, some, so New York Times and Fox News will talk about oil producers, typically, whereas smaller indie newspapers will talk about big oil and sometimes even with capital B, capital O. So it's kind of fun just to see how how machine learning was able to, with no human input at all, put all the news, these hundred newspapers in a two-dimensional plane, both with left-right bias and, and pro versus establishment critical bias. And, and these are just uh, just some um, little examples of some some tools that we made um, with, with, with MIT research or our little, our little improve the news.org nonprofit. I would love to chat with you about other tools that we, that we could work on together because I feel that technology is not evil or morally good. It's a tool and you can use it for both things. So far, I would say that, that technology machine learning has mainly been used to make our society more Orwellian. Most of the machine learning is used to analyze the users in great detail and figure out how to press their emotional buttons and hack them. But you could just as well turn those tools and to put them in the hands of the users to analyze the, the media itself, to analyze what the big corporations are doing and what the governments are doing and make that freely available to everybody. I, I, I firmly believe that tech can be incredibly democratizing and I'm super excited about the opportunities for building anti-Orwellian systems <laughs> and giving them away for free and making not just society more pleasant to live in, but enabling humanity to make much better decisions so that we can create this amazingly inspiring future that we can, that I was mentioning in the beginning. So thank you so much for having me on. 
First of all, uh, can I get a quick round of applause for Max's words? And thank you, Max, for joining us. Um, uh, so let's, let's just jump in right there. Uh, so can you maybe, um, when you describe anti-Orwellian systems, that's a great phrase, and we should be rallying um, uh, the, the group uh, towards that. Um, what are the kinds of like properties that you, that you would have, right? So basically on many of the things that you just mentioned, you can just invert those. So, um, you know, unbiased things, um, things that really get to the truth and, and as much as possible give the evidence and the sources and, and so on. You can get into um, uh, making sure there's no omissions and so on. But maybe like deeper than, than, than those, like what, what, what is the sort of like the, um, the kind of like, when, when you imagine using computers or using systems or reading media and so on, like, in, in like a great anti-Orwellian uh, um, place, like what would you sort of expect to uh, expect to see, or like pin us a bit of, a, of the vision of that? That's a great question. So let's go back to the basics and ask why do we even want it, right? Why is it better to live in an at a very practical level? I would say the non or is better. You actually make more correct predictions about what's happening. And similarly, I think humanity will make much better decisions to produce a happier future if we have a non-Orwellian society. So that, that's a very practical one. No, make good decisions. That's, again, why I mentioned if your brain were sort of more weirdly restricted, you as a human being would make better, worse decisions just for yourself even. Um, I don't... <clears throat> The um, a second one, I think, is if if, if you um, I, I'm going speak, to speak for myself now. I personally really like the idea of democracy because if what we're trying to accomplish is create a world where people are more happy rather than unhappy living, we want to make sure that the whether people that that that, 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 that um, people actually have a say, is that people can wield influence and try to push things in ways that make them more happy. So that means you want to shift power from the top to the individual people. Uh, that's, of course, the core selling point of democracy, right? So to me, Orwellian is exactly the opposite, where you take away the power from individuals and you put it all in some cent super central authority. Um, Whereas uh, anti-Orwellian should have this effect where you are instead shifting the power to individuals. Um, in, in, a, in a democracy, it's absolutely, an absolutely crucial way to do that. For do, the thing you need for doing that is to make sure that ordinary people have access to correct information. Because if people believe the world is completely different from what it actually is, right? they're going to make decisions which are often very much against the, their self-interest. So that's my that's a second guiding principle, I think. We should look at all our technology always and ask, does this technology lead to more concentration of power or does it lead to more decentralization of power? In the, in the news and information space where we create technical tools which make it really easy for people to find out the truth for themselves and make it very easy for them to see when, when the powers that be are trying to manipulate them. And that's, um, you know, a lot of the people here and a lot of our communities are working pretty hard on, on decentralizing power structures, including um, things like decentralizing economic structures and so on. Uh, the communications layer is like one of these extremely important ones to um, lock open in a way. So one of the topics that we um, uh, often talk a lot about is establishing uh, digital human rights in a way where you can have um, the freedom of being not just freedom of speech, but freedom to communicate and freedom, freedom of association on the internet, where you can uh, con uh, talk and so on. I'm pretty um, uh, keenly aware of how uh, it's not not even just kind of like 
the, the drowning out of um, kind of the signal in the, in, in the, by a lot of noise. There's also just overt uh, states shutting down complete access to communications infrastructure, where, where these days right. this means a loss of communication with your, with your family, with your loved ones, and so on. And in a crisis, like, you can't even like, interact or coordinate and so on. And so these days we've become so intensely dependent upon our products and our tools and systems that like, you know, just imagine being cut off from the ability to message or text message or call anybody or a map or, you know, like as a human, you, you can't quite even like operate nearly as well as we used to, um, just given how dependent yeah. we are on the tools. Um, and and like, yeah, you know, that, that can happen and, and overnight. I mean, on that, you, I mean it's, you see it happening today in Iran, for example, where people are not, not even able to text message each other because the government doesn't want them to talk about riots going on and to, to protest. Uh, and it, in a small way, I, I was talking about how that's happening to our improve the news effort, where we can't reach, where where eighty five percent of the people who said they want to get our news letter can't get it because somehow Google's algorithm doesn't want them to. So it's uh, it's it's extremely frustrating. In a way, we're more vulnerable to that now than we were two hundred years ago, because at least because we. Before we actually had more to face to face interactions, we didn't have as many friends who lived far away, and it was a little bit harder to actually go in and, and block that communication. Whereas now, by making friends that are not physically located where we are, and we are so vulnerable yeah. to being just shut off from them. When you think about um, just the access to information that may be uh, just kind of super biased and so on, and being able to show everybody um, all, all of it. Um, how do you think we should be equipping people to be able to um, not be swayed by it? Like we, we can have we have very clear examples of social media manipulation where you you could you know systematically um, push certain um, p certain medics like certain images and articles and so on through people's channels and feeds and so on and just kind of in a, in a very kind of like um, uh, behavioral experiment style. Uh, cause certain actions and cause certain beliefs and, and so on. So we have like a lot of evidence of, of that of that being being possible. Now, how do we kind of inoculate people to this kind of mimetic um, uh, gaps? And, and we do it sort of like a massive scale. Like uh, we have the internet, we have massive access to all human knowledge, and yet like we you know um, people can get manipulated by so kind of um, uh, like detectable um, fakes and so on. Um, and, and kind of extremely biased um, bias arguments and so on. So how, how do we kind of like, if, if we are gonna open the, the, not necessarily open the floodgates, but like really give access to everybody, how do we do it in such a way, or what, how do we equip people with, um, with the right kind of uh, cognitive tools and critical thinking to, uh, to be able to distill this? Great question. I think we need cognitive tools, but we also need good old fashioned technical tools, software for it. Cognitive tools won't be enough. The, the basic cognitive thing we want to convey to people is just, you know, to make people understand that they are being censored and that the society we, is very Orwellian right now, not only in China and in Iran and in Russia, but even in the West. Uh, it's just that in, some, in many ways, the propaganda is higher quality in the West. You know, there's this, this beautiful quote that uh, propaganda is to a democracy what violence is to an authoritarian country. You don't need to be do good propaganda if you are a dictatorship. Um, it doesn't really matter if people like you so much or not. That, um, they still can't get rid of you as the leader. Whereas in a democracy, you have to up your game and make it so that people really believe that they're not being manipulated. Uh, I, I think, frankly, just saying we're going to have a better talk cognitive toolkit is naive. Uh, Human beings are so easily hacked. My wife, Maya, whom you met, you know, her psychology research, it's, it's very clear that uh, humans are just incredibly hackable and, and we don't stand a chance against an AI system that knows everything we've clicked on in the last five years. Uh, so the only basic thing, again, that it is useful cognitively to do is just make people aware of the fact that they are being manipulated and they have to be they have to actively seek out the technical tools that can cut through the bullshit for them so, so let, but let's just let's switch to the technical tools that we also need to give to people i think yep. um first of all i would love to see more technical tools which just people can use for themselves to just verify that yes 
I'm being censored, I'm being manipulated. The, the number one thing I always teach in science courses is the importance of just trusting your own eyes and ears. When I teach about astronomy, I actually have them go out and look at the sky and figure out for themselves how the moon and the sun and earth is moving and so on. I always tell them, don't take my word for it. <laughs> Because if, if you do, you're missing num less than number one about science. Yeah. And I, I would like to have tech tools like this. That's, that's why I started today even by just showing you some experiments that you can repeat yourselves. If you don't believe that um, PressTV.com got censored, you try it on your web browser. Yeah. Um, and and um, I would like to see more of that. Uh, and um, I even bought this, the domain censored.org. So if any one of you has any cool tools and want to spend some time um, working with me on like free tools that where people can go in themselves and just see the censorship, just shoot me an email, tagmark at mit.org. Uh, sorry, tagmark. <laughs> it should be, we should build tools so that anyone who wants to know, am I really being censored? You can go to the site and be given a little list of ex Web yeah. tools, if, if they want to, to make it really easy for busy people to make their own mind up of what's happening in the news. Um, I think there's a huge range of, 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 co of cool possibilities here. Another one, um, I've been working on with Anthony Aguirre, whom you know, and Guy Dempsey and others. This is a project they started where you um, start measuring trust scores of people, not by whether the government says you should trust them, but what, based simply on their past predictions, just like in science. It's called, you can go to metaculus.org, and we're doing a much bigger thing now where we're, we're just uh, we're combining you with machine learning to try to make trust scores for newspapers, politicians, others. So you can actually hold people accountable for what they've said, and, and, and then, then people can go in themselves and have something to base them on or what they should trust, maybe which is more sensible. Max, how bad do you think the current um, manipulation really is, right? So I have a hard time kind of um, uh, giving credit right now to a lot of the social networks for, um, you know, they seem to be kind of like primarily advertised and primarily other corporations are using them and states are using them and so on. Um, but, and, and I sort of like mostly fear that in the near future, um, all of those treasure trails of information are going to be like kind of systematized and you put into some kind of like feedback yeah, yeah. and so on. But the question is like, how much is that happening already, and how how might we tell, right? So, um, is there a way where like experimentally we can kind of detect um, what kind of manipulation is happening already? Because you could have a very insidious situation where um, not only do you have like that excellent censorship that you're describing, sorry, excellent propaganda um, where the censorship just has to be much more sophisticated. There could be just this extreme degree of sophistication where it's just so light and subtle where like even, even we can detect that, we, that our uh, beliefs and, and perspectives and so on are being drastically shaped by, by some systems. Like this could be starting to happen a lot more deeply today than, than, um, than we might guess. Or, or, or how do, how do you know sure. where to draw the line? So I think here machine learning also is this incredibly powerful tool. That's why I showed you that little example of what I did with Samantha, where if you just look at a big data set, all these kind of subtle things just pop out very clearly. I would love to collaborate with people here listening to this on building other machine learning tools. One, one thing we've started doing, we call it Project Overton. So the Overton window, of course, it's defined as what's not censored, or, or more, or more rigorously, you know, what's discourse right now. It it varies a lot over time. Like the Overton wind, gay rights so was very different in the, in in Lisbon than now, country to country today. So the goal here is just use machine learning to actually the Overton window automatically by looking at, for example, what fraction of tweets get blocked in different mm. countries and as a function of time. Very doable, because yeah. you have we, the information is out there. I don't have time to look at 5 billion tweets and see which ones disappeared, but machine learning does. 
Um, these companies won't tell you what they're doing, but I think it would be really very valuable to just have like a dashboard where you can say, okay, right now, <laughs> here is what they don't want you to see. Here, here's what's okay to see. Um, here is what's blocked in these this country and that country. Again, in the spirit of empowerment, you know, put let anyone who wants for free get to see what tricks they're they're trying to pull on you. That I think uh, is quite a helpful one, and um, that 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 way even the more subtle things that you mentioned, which just on their own are hard to figure out. If you see that someone is trying to push you in that direction then you start getting a bit suspicious and maybe you start seeking out the information that can, can uh, give you a more clear view. Uh, how would you kind of, um, what those sort of like shields would you think are buildable against these kind of um, social credit style feedback mechanisms, right? So my, my expectation here is that the social credit system is working so well in China that it's going to get um, start getting exported to other countries because it'll kind of be this very, you know, smooth gradient towards like order and stability, and it'll be kind of like very um, accessible. And and the kind of um, the arc of that turning very bad is going to be so long that it'll get exported to a lot of other countries before before kind of a lot of populations realize it's too late. Uh, so what are the sort of shields that we can kind of like build in right now to try and prevent that kind of thing? Like what? How do we orient people towards um, being able to to uh, uh, like combat that kind of thing. So from our perspective, we sometimes think of it as, hey, if we can establish secure and private communications everywhere, so like, you know, you, you really force a, a uh, clean uh, inability um, from states to like spy on all communications and kind of like really establish, establish that both technologically and enshrine that in, in, in rights across states and, and, um, and, and the UN and so on. Um, but are, do, are there other kind of things that you that, that you are thinking on could be could be extremely useful? Like where um, may not be about, about communications, it could be about some other ways of coordinating or or, or things like that. Great, great question here. So social credit score systems. Uh, to what extent are they coming, and uh, what can we do? What kind of shields can we build against them? Uh, first of all, I would say, you, you talked about it in the future sense, how can we prevent them from coming from China to the West? Uh, I would argue that they already have come to the West to a significant extent. Um, we uh, There's another kind of bias. I just wasn't is, allowed to say that or my credit score would go down, Max. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they, uh, you know, it's uh, this, this bias here is a little bit more harmless. The, the reason, it, I don't think, it, it, but it just comes, it's not... The reason we underestimate the extent to which it's come here, I think, is just because many of us hang out in tech circles and at universities where, where people we know mostly have the opinions that are considered accepted right now. So that's why we don't hear a lot of anecdotes about social credit scores. But, if, but um, a lot of people at universities how, you should ask themselves, how many Trump voters have they talked to recently and heard their experiences or whatever? You know, the, I was just reading, you know, the, the, for example, the guy who found the Gab, one of the, and it's, that's, a, that's a social media company, which a lot of Trump voters use. He posted this thing about just what happened to him. And it starts by saying that, hey, let me tell you that there's a social credit score system in China, and we also have one here. He personally, when he started this, uh, Visa and MasterCard decided, first of all, that his company couldn't take credit cards for payments. And then they decided he and his wife also were banned for life from using credit cards. So if wow. he wants to take a flight from Minneapolis to New York, you know, he can't pay with a credit card. His wife can't either because she's married to a guy who did something that's considered outside the Overton window, namely. Uh, that's very social credit score, actually. Yeah. I think we, many of us in the West have, have have this misconception about what actually happens in in China and what it used to happen in communist uh, dictatorships in the Eastern Bloc. My wife grew up in a communist dictatorship under Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania, right? And she points out to me that, you know, they didn't usually just, they didn't go out and typically shoot people who complained about Ceausescu. They didn't need to. Uh, they had a social credit score system. The way it would work is, well, you know, uh, yeah, her mom, for example, she wanted to be a doc, uh, a teacher, but she didn't. They wouldn't let her become a teacher because she had a 
sort of bourgeois, too bourgeois. Her parents were a little too bourgeois, and so she didn't get that particular job, you know. Um, at MIT, we also cancel people now sometimes when they say things that um, are considered politically not quite right. You just don't get admitted to that that grad that university. You just d didn't get that promotion. Oh, your credit, you can't get a credit card thing. And normally, 99% of what's done in what was done in the old Soviet Union in, in communist Romania are these little nudges because they discover that's enough. That's all you need, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there is no shortage of things like that happening in the West. The second thing I want to say is you don't even have to go out and look in the world too much to get some indication for where there might be Orwellian stuff going on because human nature hasn't changed very much. You can read Machiavelli from the 1400s or look at the shenanigans they did in the Roman Empire. Uh, the basic incentive structure has always been the same. There's nothing new there under the sun. The only thing that's new is technology. So people with power were always trying to skew the debate and the public discourse to make people feel that they should have more power. The Swedish king Swedish propaganda getting in the way. <laughs> wow, it's fascinating. Thank you. Max, Max we, that was really funny. We, we like lost you. As soon as you started talking about the Swedish king, it all went away. The Swedish media is clearly like getting in the way. <laughs> yes. So, so the, point, the point I'm making here is just that the you would just naturally expect that any entity with power is going to be, try be trying to control the narratives and do Orwellian stuff to whatever extent technology permits them to cement that power. And it's just, this is the way things work. The only thing is, so is it surprising today that any, all governments are trying to control, use more modern tools to do that? No, of course, that's what you predict. Is it surprising that the tobacco industry tried to do some Orwellian stuff to silence scientists who talked about lung cancer too much. No, it's completely natural. Uh, and it's not new. Um, the, what is new is just the technology. And my, my, my key point is that um, you, you, should you, you should predict that any way in which powerful entities can use technology to make things more Orwellian in a way that serves them, you know, it's probably happening. They're trying the best they can. If they haven't done it, it's probably just because they haven't figured out the tech yet or because they... they it was too illegal for them to be able to do it yet. Uh, but in, and in the same way, we should ask ourselves, how can we use technology? How can we build tools that expose that and, and, and fight back against it? So on, on, and, the, and, on the credit system, so uh, you know, one of the things that we could do, and which is very common in, in our communities, is to say, hey, we need the access to digital cash and significant amount of economic freedom yeah, where yeah. you could combat the social credit system by making sure that people have the ability to have finances and access um, basic economic tools and products without any kind of association. So, so being able to have like anonymous and like fully anonymous structures to be able to have some kind of baseline rate credit system. Um, uh, and you, you could do that with crypto, right? Like you can build that kind of stuff today yeah. uh, with zero knowledge, which is which is pretty good. Like we have, you know, things like Zcash and others that give you a little bit of cash. Now it's still very police around the edges, so it's very clear like what what goes in and out and so on. And and so it, and certainly like the it, um, you you can't yet use crypto payments in a bunch of places. But but maybe if we if we solve the adoption there and we can get um, uh, crypto finance and crypto economics um, there, like maybe we'll be in a better spot. W what are some of these other things? So. Um, what about like access to infrastructure? So I think it, there's there's this pernicious problem around um, making everything very identity based on the internet, where if you suddenly have the ability to uh, detect who everybody is and and so on, you could land yourself in a structure where um, every moment where you're going to be um, using whatever service or buying something, you could have a, a system that immediately checks in that moment 
um, with some like centralized database of of like um, of the social credit system and whether or not you like deserve the right to uh, to use this sort of thing. And we could kind of like establish um, constraints against that right now. I think at least in the West, uh, we don't yet have that degree of um, of checking. So this seems like a policy thing that we could get through. Um, like I wonder if like maybe this is worth like a like a a, uh, a policy video like the like um, like Slaughterbots where we we show how bad and permit pernicious this could get and we try and get like some some bans on this kind of behavior where at least access to basic systems and basic utilities should be sort of guaranteed close to as a human right um, in a bunch of places in an anonymous um, sort of way. I Music to my ears, I think it's a really good idea to make, make effective videos making clear to people how awful things get if you do things in certain ways. So let's see what the point is. Uh, let's geek out a little bit though and just go through a wish list of, of, of empowering tech, anti-Orwellian anti um, systems. So, so Orwellian systems want to limit people's ability to communicate with each other. So what do we have against that? <laughs> Anti-Orwellian systems, cryptography, first of all, is great for making sure people can't read what you do. Even in the West, like France has been trying hard to ban, ban strong cryptography. Uh, but so far, you know, so, so that, anyway, but that's a, that's a great one. And then the anonymity, ability for people to, to communicate anonymously, um, any technology there is super valuable. Another thing Orwellian tech, Orwellian systems try to do is social credit score systems where once they find out that you've been doing naughty things, they try to punish you by making it hard for you to just live your life, right? So t blocking your ability to transact, for example, buy, buy train tickets, buy stuff. Uh, so DeFi, I think, is a great anti-Orwellian system there uh, in that um, you can still use cryptocurrency and do your transactions. Uh, another thing which um, is... Um, so, so crypto today, cryptography today, of course, is, is quite effective if you're communicating with one other person. But if you want to commun have, a, have a public square where people can discuss more openly, um, there I think there's a lot of room for better anti-Rowellian systems still. Uh, whenever there is a system that's very popular and large, like Facebook or whatever, governments and other powerful entities see that and start putting pressure on those companies to not just make money, but to selectively limit things to, to favor the powers that, that be. And um, so I would love to see more innovation in that space. Uh, one uh, anti-Orwellian strategy there I think is, is very interesting is adversarial interoperability. That's quite the mouthful. And for those of you who haven't heard about it, maybe we should take a minute to just unpack what it means. So um, an old fashioned way of fighting against Orwellian system is to try to make laws to protect people against them. And that's usually pretty doomed because it takes 10 years to do the law. And by that time, they've figured out five other ways of screwing you over. Like in Massachusetts, we had uh, passed a law once upon a time saying that auto mechanics should be allowed to fix cars that had some computer chips in them by actually reading out information from them. And when the law finally passed, almost immediately the auto companies protocols and so that was not covered by the law. But whereas if you instead just pass a law saying that the default is that anyone, any innovator, entrepreneur should be able to um, build whatever products they want that can be sold to auto mechanics. And if they can, if some private company can figure out how, how Ford encodes the fact that there is a problem with uh, cylinder three in the engine, they're free to go ahead and fix it. Th that way, it's not actually illegal for people to innovate. And now you don't have to worry about laws. The, the capitalism will take care of it. You know, some MIT students will figure out how to do it and sell a chip to all the auto mechanics. Um, with social media, I would love to see something like this. Also, a law saying that um, by default, People are allowed to uh, write software which logs in as them on Facebook 
and presents their own Facebook feed to them in whatever way they want. There was a company actually that started out doing this where you could log into Facebook and all your other social media also and have it presented to you on a single unified page and you could post wherever you wanted. Sort of, and, and they were sued into a smoking creator by Facebook. And um, if, if, but if you, have, if, you, if you have a law saying that the default is that these things are legal rather than the default is illegal, now it becomes a market opportunity for tech startups to, to create new things. And you, you start, you really, that's the best way to break up the monopoly power of, of the social media giants. I would love to see that. It's a, it's a, you'll have to, you're, you're the master of coming up with good phrases that have the in them. <laughs> 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 this is some sort of the social media where, where you don't have to break up Facebook into, or anything like that. You just let people innovate. And uh, I would much prefer having my own software that I bought from some company, which logs into all my social media and gives me control. Uh, like email is, you know, if, if, if I don't like Gmail because it puts all the messages from, from you in my spam filter, I'll switch to a different email provider. There's, a, there's an SMTP protocol and it's, I don't lose access to emailing just because I leave Gmail, right? Whereas if I, I will lose aspect, access to all my Facebook friends if I leave Facebook, with that serial interrupt, it wouldn't be that way. Yep. I would be able to do what I would be able to access just yep. like I can have many email clients. I could have many social media. I would see them all in the same place. And, and, and if I don't, if Facebook's user interface sucks, I use a different one. I, th I think we'll get these um, Web3 social networks that do just that. Like we have the beginnings of a few. They're, not, of course, not scalable yet to be able to handle um, the, the large scale volume of traffic. But my guess is that we'll get there in the next two years. Two to three years is my estimate for when we'll see uh, social networks that are in Web3 that have um, massive scale uh, adoption. So th things, things like uh, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of users. And from there, like, you know, fr from 10 to a billion is like n not as hard as, you know, from one to 10. Um, for this one, though, I think to, to, to unleash this wave of tech innovation, you really need it. Also, a legal victory. European Union is probably the best, most yeah. likely place to get it. Where uh, if the European Union passes a law saying that by default these things are legal rather than illegal yeah. to do, uh, then um, are, are you familiar this, with this, fully homomorphic encryption? Um, like the the um, there's like this cryptographic um, the set of cryptographic methods that let you um, encrypt programs and encrypt data and then run the encrypted program over the encrypted data in anybody's computer, but the computer can't tell at all what program it ran or what the data was or what the output is at all. And so it's extremely, you know, ex outrageously expensive, so that's why we, we don't use it yet. Um, but the sort of like predictions are that within the next five, six years, it'll become practical uh, to be able to actually run these kinds of things at a large scale. Do you think like the, the, the EU could like, we, we could like mount a very strong campaign in, in, in Europe about this and um, use, uh, use the very kind of privacy sensitive. Um, uh, We're having um, some bandwidth issues again here, I think. Oh yeah, uh, so, so um, I was mentioning um, uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Let me know if you can hear me, uh, is it good? Now I can. Great, so uh, fully homomorphic encryption being um, this cryptographic method for encrypting programs and encrypted data and, and, and being able to run a program over that data in anybody's computer without the computer telling uh, what it is. So we could kind of get a policy victory in in Europe to try and kind of force all of the social networks to to start computing with with this these kinds of methods. They're too expensive right now, but say within the next um, the next five five to six years, we should be able to do this. Yeah, I think that that's that's fantastic. And we, so we want to we, whenever you talk to politicians and policymakers, yeah, it's important that we all explain to them how pro democracy and anti Orwellian it is to have these laws where. By default, doing the tech innovation, doing startup companies that empower the individual should be legal. It should not by default be illegal. And once you have that, I think, I think the marketplace will be way more efficient than a bunch of little laws here and there trying to yep. regulate what's gonna happen. If we continue coming back to the wish list, so you asked what can we do to prevent the 
our society from getting more Orwellian. Um, so we talked about privacy, we talked about encryption, you talked about homeomorphic encryption, you talked about being able to do things anonymously. Then we started talking about ability to do stuff in society, so making it harder for, for the Orwellian systems to prevent us from going shopping and, and things like this. Uh, there, obviously, crypto is great. Uh, crypto still is... It, it's not very hard if you do a lot of stuff with your crypto wallet for people to figure out what... Yeah, hundred percent. You're, it, it's you're totally on the, the blockchain. Clear. Yeah, yeah, it's totally yeah, in the clear so, right now. We we totally need to encrypt all of that. So we, we were just uh the, the talk before this one um uh, was from Nim and talking about like you know mixed nets and getting getting full privacy. So um, there are a number of these chains that will get fully private, but it'll be a it'll be a big fight with with um with policymakers and so on because the moment that yeah. you know large amounts of of money can move in in full secrecy, then then you get into all the questions around sanctions and so on. Um, so, so it's going to be really important to to press the case on yeah. why why this is extremely critical to 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 um, to support for for the future of democracy. Even even if you had a partial victory, suppose you just said that well, small maybe large amounts of money would freak out governments, but small amounts of money, you know. Yeah, exactly. If 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 you do ten thousand dollars of something in a year, you know. At least let them not block that, right? Yep. Um, because mo I think most of the things where they make it hell for for people in an Orwellian way are actually the little things. You know, you just could, can't buy that little air ticket you needed, which just cost two hundred dollars. WikiLeaks um, they, they prevent people from giving a five dollar donation to them because credit card companies decide that uh, you know yeah. you can't use them. Even if so even if you want a small victory like this and said that. There's a there's a limit, which could be yeah. hardwired into these, these these anonymized blockchain systems, uh, where these, these small transactions you can do. You know, so maybe there can be a limit on how many you can do per year and total dollars, whatever. That would be a huge huge win uh, on for the anti Orwellian yeah. let, side. Let me get, uh, source some questions from the audience and from Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, just um, ask a question with uh, PL breakthroughs. Um, and I will um, I'll check it out. So hashtag PL breakthroughs. And here, um, if, raise your hands, and, and we'll try and build a queue. All right, first question. And please say your name. Uh, sure. Um, Although, unless, actually, for privacy reason, if you don't feel comfortable saying Well, my name is also Max, <laughs> so to make it easy. Um, fantastic. Awesome. Um, one quick question. You talk about Orwellian systems. Do we have like a measure or like a metric of how Orwellian a system is? Let's say Orwell, the book is like 100% Orwellian. Some hunter-gatherer society in the jungle is like 0% Orwellian. Where, how do we measure that we can say currently Europe is like 70%, China is 80%, and some other countries only 40%, and how do we, how much Orwellian is actually still okay or acceptable versus where it's very critical for a society? I love this question. You know, they say that sunshine is the best disinfectant. And, and having a, an Orwellometer, just trusted, transparent, for which pranks countries, companies, uh, other systems, this way could be very, very valuable. I think Orwellianess is uh, so my T-shirt, you know, pretty high Orwellian score. But but you have there, there may, there's there's a number of factors that go into Orwellianess. That you can measure separately. One is stuff to do with information flow, right? Levels of censorship. We talked about how how I think there's a real po great possibility to use machine learning to quantify that in a very objective way that people can verify it themselves. Um, privacy. You can you can think of benchmarks there also, where where which are very transparent to specify. You know, this is what we're counting. And this is how the Orwellian score comes up. So that is, you can, uh, a key thing for if you do the Orwellian.com site yourself, where people can see how Orwellian different things are. The first thing you have to make sure is your site is not Orwellian. That it's not the Max's Orwellian committee that just got together and gazed into their belly buttons and ranked people. You have to have the scientific approach 
where there is references. You can click on each number there and see exactly how it was computed so people can reproduce it themselves. Um, so information flow, there's some sub aspect to this, you know, to what extent is information blocked, to what extent is it censored, et cetera, to what extent is it private. And then you can look at, um, again, finance, to what extent is finance Orwellian, uh, does the country allow cash, is cash banned, uh, do you, uh, can, to what extent are trying, to how much blah, blah, this and that. Um, and then, yeah, for each, for each aspect of Orwellian to, to what extent does, does, um, your political, do your political opinions affect, uh, your career advancement? For example, I'm very embarrassed that MIT, my own university, uh, we recently, we had a guy who was going to come in and talk about, um, the climate on extrasolar planets. And he was canceled all of a sudden because he had written an article in Newsweek about university admission systems. And uh, they had nothing to do with extrasolar planets. He wasn't even going to come and talk about politics at all at MIT. This reminded me a lot of my friend Alex Vilenkin, one of the pioneers of the Big Bang Theory with inflation. He did some, he, he said some stuff when he lived in the Soviet Union that they didn't like. And as a result, uh, he got canceled, his grad school got canceled, you know. So uh, you could quant try to quantify that too. It's actually a really good exercise. You you're tempting me now to spend a bunch of time uh, writing down a scoring system. The different it. corp components, Orwellianism, Let, and then um, let, let's build it. So, uh, Orwell, yeah, uh, email yeah. me, email yeah. me if you want to. Anyone listening to this wants to spend some time volunteering doing it. I think let's do it. All right. Uh, next question. Hi, Max. Um, half hour speaking here. So, on your research on what is left and what is right, um, well, the machine learning detected what what were the subjects pertaining each area, so each side, right? Um, did it discover what is left and right by itself, or was yes. it a tag that you implied? So what we did was something extremely simple. We just took a million articles from 100 newspapers, and we trained the machine learning to predict which newspaper the article was from, with that, just from the, the, the text, OK? That was the task. So that doesn't mention left or right or anything, right? And we discovered that it was got very good at it. So we started to wonder, well, how is it doing it? And then if you look at the actual paper, we were able to add, do some machine learning transparency stuff and figure out how it was doing it. And we noticed that it was doing it in a way that you could easily visualize with a sort of generalization of principal component analysis by plotting things in this plane that I showed you. And then when we humans looked at it, we were like, wait a minute, this is like left versus right, um, the way it had sorted the newspapers. It just sort of popped out. It had no idea what left was or right was or whatever, but it, the, that, that spectrum, it just emerged from, from the data, just from, um, and also the pro-establishment versus establishment critical, just from that task of trying to predict which newspaper wrote each article. So this gives me a lot of hope again. That was only one million articles. There are way there are much more tweets than that, of course. Th that, that suggests that so uh, we need uh, articles and publications in the negative space, right? So you you spot uh, gaps there in in that in that chart, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. There's, there's no articles or pieces in 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 some of this. All right, next question back there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the American elections are, are coming up, and uh, I noticed in the past week that. A lot of Democrat, uh, a lot of emails that I get from Democrats that usually go in the promotions folder are got automatically moved to my main inbox folder. Really? And I remember the same thing happening in 2016 when Bernie, Sandy, Bernie Sanders was running, and all of those emails went from my main inbox to my promotions folder. And <laughs> you mentioned similar things, and so what I'm wondering is, in the face of such blatant, you know, social engineering and manipulation, e even if you might lean more towards the people who are doing that, like, how, how do you handle people who might have reactionary tendencies to this kind of, uh, you know, behavior, basically? 
what do you do so, from a moral uh, perspective? Thank you for, for sharing this spectacular example. This is another great thing that should go in the orwellometer that we, we can build together, right? It's very easy to just set up a bunch of, set up a large number of, of uh, Gmail accounts and have them subscribe to different things and then automatically monitor what goes into the promotions folder and what goes into the spam folder, which has now been hidden under the three dots where you click more and what goes into your main inbox and just look at quantify how it measures goes over time and, and have, have that as a website. I would check that website from time to time. It would be quite entertaining to see what what and and once it becomes quite scientific like that that this is a site that's trusted and reputable and people can reproduce themselves then it starts to become embarrassing for google they'll start getting questions and they'll probably dial it down tone it dial it down at least a bit and 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 now things are a little bit less orwellian so this is another example of of how um the best disinfectant is sunshine you shine light on the Orwellian behavior and you actually get less of it. You don't have to ever even um, make any laws or anything. You just make it easy for people to see it. All right, next question. Great, great conversation. Um, Vincent's my name. Uh, my question goes in the direction more on like the asymmetry that we've seen like in like misinformation and like a lot of like generated, of course, like uh, influence, especially around elections from like counterparties or whatever you want to call them. W and wait until all the GPTs get on this, exactly like, this, like, this next election. <laughs> this, this was actually the question, like a direction I wanted to ask is like w with like this will only increase, like you already have like millions of bots creating like a lot of misinformation and like leading to stuff like anti-vax and like explosion and like people, for example, and stuff like vaccination. Like what, like on the not negative side, but like how, how would you like kind of like protect against this in this anti orwellian more decentralized media um, age, like with like an explosion in bots, explosion in misinformation, explosion in like large language models and GPT and uh, generating even increasingly like well argued um, misinformation, like you can see with stuff like, I think the debate stuff Open AI is doing. Um, like, like how do we protect against that um, increasingly well orchestrated asymmetric kind of warfare, information warfare? Mm -hmm. the, um, so we, we've talked about various tools already here right, that we could try to build. I, I think we should also protect by a little bit our own brains by just being very careful to not use the word in what words we use. I showed you those examples of word use that the machine learning discovered is biased and you, this information is one of those words, right? Uh, do you use the word disinformation or do you use the word anti-disinformation or do you use the word censorship? They are, don't mean exactly the same thing, but if someone is trying to perpetrate censorship, they're going to call the things that they're censoring disinformation. So I, I really don't like that word at all. I think it's very, very uh, uh, loaded. Even even um, conspiracy theory is another one of those words where, of course, there are people who, who believe that the world is flat and whatever, but the, the conspiracy theory was actually first, first came into use shortly after the Kennedy assassination. And from some declassified documents, you can see that it was the CIA, actually, that came up with a phrase and started pushing it as a way of just shutting down argue, certain kinds of arguments where instead of saying, you know, I disagree with your argument, you're wrong because of X, Y, Z, you would just say, this is conspiracy theory. I'm not going to talk to you. I don't talk to conspiracy theorists. Um, in, in science, we've seen this happening throughout the ages. In the Middle Ages, you didn't call someone a conspiracy theorist. If you, did, you wanted to silence them, you would call them a heretic. And I, you know, like, I don't talk to heretics, so shut up, you know, go away. Uh, I would encourage all of you to stop using these very emotionally <laughs> loaded words. And, and I, don't, I, I don't even feel that uh, disinformation is the biggest threat that we face. You know, I think you, you, all of you listening to this, are very good at calling bullshit on things. If I start telling you some random bullshit about how, uh, whatever, China is the greatest democracy on earth, you know, does that mean you're going to believe it? Of course not. 
Uh, if, if, if someone tries to come and sell you some snake oil, are you immediately going to buy it? Of course not. You're not morons. You're so used to, 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 to calling bullshit on things. And um, I don't think the biggest problem is that we have to protect you from seeing bullshit. You're perfect. Quite, a much bigger problem is that important information is withheld from you entirely and you just see one side of the argument. So, um, I don't, the, the, the question you ask is a very good one. What can we do to, to fight back against Orwellian systems? If we had a super simple answer, we would have won this battle already. It's, so it's obviously hard. But I think we did talk about a number of, of tech tools that we can build. And Juan, you mentioned some more cool yeah, ideas. Yeah, um, Vincent's question was a little some bit about... Said, yeah, the, just, I would the, just say, let, let's work together and, and figuring out, figure out what are the main things that should be built and, and let's build them and let's make them free and cool and easy to use so that um, the same tools that are being used right now to make their systems more Orwellian, those tools are being used for anti-Orwellian purposes. That's the basic game plan I would advocate. Yeah, and, and um, Max, what, what about the like deluge of information that is coming? So, you know, when you think about GPT-3 and just generating just vast amounts of um, of, of this material, including like you know, like deep fakes and um, and and so on that are that are coming, um, how do we like uh, generate some um, good like antibodies for that, or or, or just can like equip people well? Like, there's been some pretty yeah, this is gonna get like the the, the manipulation and and, um, uh, uh, and and faking of things is gonna get like very strange this election cycle. Oh, for sure, and for sure, for sure, the fakes are getting so good. I think we should, we should use all the tools we can. On on one hand, it's still good to keep pushing for some legislation. Like I would love to see a, a bot or not law at the federal level and in the European Union level, where there's just a law saying that. Um, if you show a deep fake or if you get called up by somebody who pretends to be a person, even though there's a robot, there has to be some little message there that informs the human that this is actually fake. Um, in addition to that, of course, you want to build technology tools f for it. And uh, you could imagine maybe future cameras have uh, just something where they do a hash of the image and put it on the blockchain or whatever so that you can have so that later on it becomes possible to always verify what is actually real. And, and there's a lot of commercial opportunities for, for startup companies to do these technologies. I think the market for tools that tell the consumer what they can actually believe is gonna just keep growing with, with all, the, all these things that are happening. And for, not just for seeing what's fake, but also for for law figure, for people to know if the system is being loyal to them. Like if I have a, a G, if I have a, an Alexa in my house, you know, I would be happy to pay a little bit extra for it if I knew that it was actually loyal to me in the sense of only serving my interests, not Amazon's interests. If 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 I'm using some tool to help me navigate when I drive from A to B. I would pay a little bit extra to know that it's not always routing me, routing me past the McDonald's when it thinks I'm hungry, but actually taking me in the shortest path. But it's loyal to me, not to some company. Uh, so I think this is a, this is a real profit opportunity for companies right now to have, you know, just like you can have certain food products that are certified organic, and people are willing to pay pay a premium for having less pesticides in their food. If you can have a certification system that can certify that this thing, this photo is actually not fake, or this personal assistant is actually loyal to you, and it's certified by this nonprofit organization that you set up, I think people will pay a premium for these certified non-Orwellian things, which means that the marketplace and innovation can really do the rest. Yeah. Val from Twitter asks, do you know of any model country or government that are right now on the way of reducing their censorship at home? So countries that are reducing censorship. Uh, sadly, I don't. <laughs> uh, do you? 
you know, I, I, um, I'm spending a lot more time in Europe and, and, uh, and in Iceland, and I've definitely felt the huge difference of being in the, spending most of the, um, you know, spending a lot of time in, in, in various places in the US versus sp spending time in Europe. And just the amount of political content on all of my, my systems has gone like way down. So it's not quite any country reducing, but there's definitely like differential, um, uh, there's, there's definitely a huge difference here. And so you could uh, uh, adapt your, you, definitely like the or Orwellometer, or at least that form of, that particular feature is, was not as, as high in, this, in these other places. So it, it's definitely different from place to place in space. Uh, but I think in over time it seem feel feels like it's it's getting worse. Yeah, everything is ratcheting up. Yeah. Recently, the, and often they use the others, you know, like as an excuse to make themselves worse. Also, so they're like, oh, you know, Russia is so bad that to make sure that you uh, be protected against that, we are also going to become more totalitarian by banning Russian newspapers. Uh, actually, America is less censorious than you than the European Union now, which was very surprising to me. In America, you can read RT.com just fine. Uh, the American government trusts people to read bullshit from Russia <laughs> newspapers. The there European might, might also be some interest there. Uh. No, but I think it's more the First Amendment actually is quite yeah. strong. And uh, there is no nothing quite that strong in European legislation. But I would love it if if if, if you can t tell me about one role model country that we can that we can point to and which is doing this experiment of having less censorship uh, as yeah. a data point. I'll see what happens. Um, yeah. right. Otherwise, um, we'll build it here with yeah. better tools. Max, we've uh, arrived at uh, 8.30, um, which is uh, our, our time to go. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's been uh, tremendously enlightening and fun and hopefully super useful to a lot of people building. Uh, I look forward to making a lot of these things uh, with you. Uh, let's make that our well meter and many of the other uh, tools we touched on. Um, again, thanks for joining us, and uh, 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 goodbye. Thank you so much. This was really, really fun. And uh, if you want to work with me or any, to build stuff or want more ideas, tagmark at mit.edu. Love to work together. I don't want to whine about stuff. I want to build stuff. Great. Take care. Have a great day.